teach. Um, even when you think you have preparations in place, it can be really a difficult experience. So what we want to do here is just review how to be as prepared as possible and to have some important conversations with your parents before they're really needed. Um, we want to start by acknowledging that these can be difficult conversations to have in, in many and maybe most families. So when we say conversations you should have now, um, what we really mean is at least start now. It's going to, there's a spectrum of where your parents are. Um, they may be perfectly self-sufficient right now to really needing a lot of help. So these are really conversations that you kind of have to judge along the way. Um, as I said, every family dy dynamic is different. So some basic advice maybe to approach these conversations is just to be as respectful as possible. Um, I'm gonna say most parents don't like getting advice from their children, even if your intention is only to be helpful. So being respectful of the fact that they're still the parent and you know this is all about being prepared, that you're not telling them what to do. Um, the basic, tension as parents age is that adult children get really concerned about their safety and their health um, of their parents and the parents mostly are focused on wanting to maintain their independence so there's a tension there and i found keeping this in mind to be really helpful when i was dealing with my my own father's health declining um, it really helped me to think about it in those terms um, so we're gonna cover four key areas. Uh, first, legal documents that you should make sure are in place and um, other financial intervention where you may, your parents might need help as they age, including conversations about living arrangements as well. And then we'll talk about the, the costs that go into um, changes in living arrangements and how to prepare for those. Um, we're going to finish up with a little bonus, some tech solutions um, that may be able to help or are geared to helping parents stay in their homes longer. I think that's really interesting as well. So first and foremost is making sure that your parents have legal documents signed while they're still perfectly capable, capable of managing their own affairs. Um, the first uh, thing we want to talk about is probably the easiest to execute on and that's naming a trusted contact or making sure that they have named a trusted contact. Um, since about 2018, um, financial firms, including our firm and, and Schwab, where we custody most of our accounts, now request that um, people name a trusted contact on their account. So it's not required and so some people haven't done it, but make sure that, that they fill this out. So what that is, is someone who's named on an account who will be contacted by the financial institution in the event that the primary account holder is not responsive, responsive to requests, or if they begin to make unusual requests um, about their accounts. So the trusted contact doesn't really have access to specific information. It's really about the financial firm confirming with you um, if they see something unusual or they have concerns. It's a little bit one way, that way. Um, your parents can also authorize someone to act as an authorized agent um, on an account by account basis. And that um, they set up with the specific financial institution. And it allows different layers of access. So for example, they can give access to you to just view an account um, they can also give access for you to view and help them trade or really give you full power to view and trade um, and even to transfer funds. But this can allow you to help to check on any unusual activity. Um, so an authorized agent is going to have more access than a trusted contact. Um, and then the third item listed here, a durable power of attorney um, is a legal document. So it's not provided by the financial institution, although sometimes they want their own forms. Um, but this allows a person, you to really act in that person's shoes in all manner of financial and legal matters. Um, being a durable power means that it continues when the person becomes 
incapacitated or incompetent in some way. So you want to make sure that it's a durable power of attorney. Um, there are some cases when the power of attorney doesn't come into effect until the person is deemed unable to make decisions on their own. Um, and that's the, um, known as a springing power. Um, but unless it specifically says that it doesn't, a, a doctor has to certify them as incompetent, it would be in effect once it's signed and throughout their incapacity. It does end at death. Um, so that's a really important piece to have in place to help with financial matters should your parent become um, incompetent. Um, the durable power acts on a full range of, of financial and legal activities, as I said, but it doesn't um, extend to making healthcare decisions. So for that, you need a separate healthcare power of attorney in order to make decisions on their behalf um, if they can't make decisions about their own health care. Um, given that, it's really encouraged for everyone's benefit that, the, and especially for the person that's named the health care power of attorney, that your parents also have an advanced health care directive so that they can state specifically, as specifically as possible, what kind of care and what kind of care they don't want in terms of end of life treatments. Um, and this can really help reduce any conflict among loved ones at really critical times when decisions have to be made about continuing care. It can be really stressful and sometimes they've given different verbal instructions to different people. So having things in writing is, is just really important there. And then the last thing mentioned here, um, if your parents do have a trust account, one thing we advise is for to have someone besides them act as co-trustees. Most typically a couple serves as co-trustees of their trust, but adding a third co-trustee, um, it doesn't change their control of the account, but it does add another person, which can be helpful with logistics. So if funds are needed to be moved for some kind of care, for example, that third trustee can help with that. Um, more often you see adult children named as successors, but it doesn't. that doesn't provide for uninterrupted management, um, especially if only one person, one parent is serving as trustee if the other has passed away. Um, and you see that fairly often. So being named as co-trustee throughout can be really helpful. Um, conservatorship is named here, but it's really not a document. Um, conservatorship is a formal judicial process that you put in place when to put someone else in charge of managing all of a person's affairs. So it involves medical assessments. You need to do an inventory of assets. There has to be a written plan for the conservatorship. And it requires ongoing oversight by the courts, which the power of attorney and trust that we mentioned earlier don't, don't require that. Um, if it's available and, and a family member might petition the court, um, they could be named as a conservator and there are also professional conservators that could be named, but it's really, this is something that might come into play if the other documents are not, not in, um, in effect. So it's a little bit of a last resort because of the level of judicial oversight. So um, sometimes what, oops, sorry. Um, what keeps people from failing to execute on these documents, which are so critical to have, um, but sometimes people don't aren't able to do it because they don't know who to choose. That I think is by far the um, the reason we see that when we have people that don't have documents in place. So we generally advise um, what we call the core four criteria to look at: aptitude, interest, um, time, and location. So it's great to be able to get all four of these attributes when you're looking or, or your parents are looking to name people to serve as powers of attorney or co-trustees, that's not always possible. So you may have to settle for, for less than that. But um, what's 
less important and that sometimes people get stuck on is trying to equalize um, who is named among the siblings. That it shouldn't be as much of a, a criteria as a lot of people um, maybe make it a priority. Um, in my family, for example, I'm the youngest sibling, but you know, I have some financial skills. So I was named as power of attorney and co-trustee. And I think everyone was on board with that. Um, it, the, when you think of aptitude, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone with a legal or financial background. Sometimes it's just the person that can get along with the others and, and communicate maybe uh, um, well with others. So your definition of aptitude, given who you have to choose from, um, can be important. Um, in terms of interest, it's not likely that you're going to find someone that's just keenly interested in serving in these roles, but it's definitely best to, to uh, choose someone that at least has a level of interest that they will be able to focus on their responsibilities and, and carry them out. Um, in terms of a trustee or, or really all of the roles, there can be a fair amount of admin duties and it can be time consuming. So, you know, ch choosing someone that's really busy in other ways may lead to some frustration. Um, in terms of location, um, there's certainly a lot of people in the Bay Area who don't live near their parents. Pro probably when it comes to healthcare issues, it can be closer to live, it can be better to, to live closer, just so that um, in terms of accompanying them to appointments if needed and that kind of thing. Um, but the most important thing is to not let not knowing who to choose be an obstacle. Um, to just do the best you can and encourage them to do the best they can and maybe helping them find a professional who will also encourage them. Um, it's really the most, the most critical piece. So in addition to the documents, probably the next most important conversation um, is to become aware or, or know um, more mundane tasks about what their monthly bills are and and so that over time you might be able to check and, and see and make sure things are being paid properly and that there's no out of the ordinary expenses. Um, elder exploitation is really a growing issue and sometimes parents may be too embarrassed to admit that they've made a mistake or they bought some kind of home warranty or a subscription service or something where they have kind of gotten stuck. Um, we can all lose track of our subscriptions. So framing it as a way to make that an entree into the conversation of, oh, I checked my subscriptions and I was able to cancel some because there are so many is a way to, to check and be helpful. Um, in my case, actually, I started before I even started checking bills for my father, I could at least see them being paid as an authorized agent on um, his accounts. And so I noticed a really high visa bill and asked him about it. And, you know, could we look at that together? And I saw a subscription service for a newsletter that he had signed up for, for the incredibly reasonably cost of a thousand dollars. So he had bought something online that he didn't mean to. Um, and so we called and canceled it, but that's the kind of thing that can go unnoticed. Um, and so it's kind of a spectrum along where you are in, in helping and engaging with your parents over time. Um, we mentioned credit card and utility bills here um, because just logistically, it's important that both parents are on um, credit card bills so that if one dies, the other, it can continue uninterrupted. So if one parent is just an um, additional cardholder, they might lose access to that in the case of the death of the primary cardholder. So just be aware of that. Um, and then tax preparation, we mentioned here separately, just because it's an area where people can get, it gets to be a lot as you get older, um, getting things together and where people um, your parents might need help. So just, again, awareness of that.
a few more um, things about trying to keep an eye on your parents' finances. One of the things I learned from healthcare professionals when my father's health was declining is that your parents, like all of us, are allowed to make bad decisions. So I think many people age without any cognitive decline at all. Um, but I think as an adult child trying to be helpful, sometimes you're really alert to behavior changes and it's hard to know the difference between a bad decision they're making or a decision you consider bad and, and cognitive changes that might need attention. So checking on them doesn't necessarily mean making judgments about how they're spending their money. Um, it's more about looking for patterns and maybe something is wrong that would evolve over time. Um, so when we went over um, some of the access to the financial accounts, remember that even if you're named on accounts, unless they're deemed to be incompetent by a physician, they're able to act fully as well. And you're not really taking over those accounts at all. You may They may do some things that you don't think are prudent, um, but they're still making decisions until a doctor says that they are, you know, aren't competent to do so. Um, in terms of medical information, we talked about the healthcare proxy, the healthcare power of attorney, um, and getting that in place. But you should also know that even if you're not named the healthcare POA, um, HIPAA privacy rules do not necessarily prevent you from getting medical in information about your parent. They can sign HIPAA authorizations with their doctor to share information with many people if, if they want to, and they can actually even give verbal approval, especially if you're the one accompanying them to appointments. Um, and in the case of an emergency, um, a doctor will provide some kind of need to know information at, at that time. So it's, again, a good to kind of keep these things in perspective over time. Um, the next kind of most important conversation is around living arrangements. So usually I would say the, the first choice that we see among our clients is to stay in their homes. Um, but sometimes it gets difficult because of changes in health or their friends and family are elsewhere. So they want to make a change to be closer to that, to someone, a loved one. Um, so this is something to, to stay on top of it. We, we had a client who was in her early nineties, really sharp, really healthy, um, and still living in the house where she raised her children. Um, and that's what they understood that she wanted. That's what she had said. Um, so they were really focused on, on helping her to continue. And one day, um, she just had changed her mind and she wanted to go to a retirement community where her friends and family had moved. Um, she said she was tired, tired of making her own meals and she was a little lonely uh, living alone. And so we changed her planning for that. Um, so, and even if they do end up staying in their homes the whole time, there may be costs for upgrades or, or some physical changes and accommodations that they're gonna need help with um, over time. The the biggest cost factor to um, staying um, in your home or in their home is going to be if they need to get home health care, which um, we'll talk about the cost of that in a minute. Um, moving in with family sometimes is the, the next step um, moving with you or maybe another of their children. Um, this is a, a a big discussion and kind of a family discussion about how that might work in terms of who bears the costs um, if the parent doesn't have enough resources. Because uh, sometimes siblings are in different financial positions. So one might offer accommodations, but someone else might pay, you know, help pay for that. But it can be an effective solution to um, have a parent nearby. I know other people who live in the Bay Area, whose parents live far away, who uh, or want to make accommodations to have them come live with them. And, um, you know, that affects their own financial planning. One kind of new-ish option 
is um, elder co-housing, which is is described as aging with friends, which is kind of intriguing. It's um, a shared community and shared care options that evolve over time. So it's a relatively new idea, but it's something kind of between staying with family and more institutional care. Um, everyone's probably somewhat familiar with assisted living. Um, there's a range of care levels and costs for this. Usually, um, there's a continuum of care um, from almost independent living to providing just meals or aids for transition, reminders to take medicines or help with, with taking medicines, um, and sometimes a, a separate memory care facility. Um, and then a nursing home is really for skilled nursing care that can't be provided at assisted living. So um, there's really a range of, of options or things that could be discussed. Lissette, are we seeing uh, any changes in terms of people's preferences in light of COVID? Right. So it, you, actually that, that um, client that I alluded to earlier um, was planning to go into that retirement home right around the time COVID hit and then was very happy that they didn't because I think people are a little um, more careful about any kind of congregate care because it, it hit nursing homes so hard or, or assisted living facilities so hard. And, and that may be one of the, the reasons why elder co-housing or figuring out ways to have kind of a, an additional dwelling unit or ha be with family um, have become more widely discussed because it allows you to have more separation, more of your own space and, and care. So I think that's a good point. And I think that may continue to change as, um, you know, as all the changes that came with COVID kind of um, pervade society. Um, I was going to, to talk a little bit with, about some, some, does that answer your question or? It does, yes. Well, I was wondering because um, I, I think we've seen a little bit of, of two sides of the spectrum. One is that uh, seniors who are living alone felt very lonely and isolated mm. during COVID, but of course okay. felt very concerned about any, any uh, congregant living. Um, right. And so it makes these elder uh, co-living arrangements more attractive, uh, moving into an additional dwelling unit with a family, some kind of living with other people without, as you said, without being in an institution, so. Right, yeah, I think that those will gain, in terms of trends, I think those will gain in popularity. Um, we included this chart really to give you a sense that even if your parents are really capable of taking care of themselves now, these are things you should be thinking about because it's highly likely that they're going to need some sort of care. Um, at some point, about 64% of men and 75% of women, since they generally live longer and, and are alone, um, are going to need some kind of care. And some might only need unpaid care, which is where, where you come in. Um, and But sometimes, or more likely, it's some kind of combination of care um, over time. So it's just good to, to keep this in mind and be on the lookout for, for different options. Um, this is really to show you just more vividly how important it is to adult children in terms of unpaid care providers. Um, we are by far the biggest providers of that care. Um, more than half of unpaid care is provided by adult children. So, and it could be over an extended period. Um, it really can take a lot of time and resources. Um, even if there's paid care, someone has to help manage that paid care. Um, there's a 40% chance that it would be needed for more than five years or more than a 40% chance that for women anyway, that it would be um, needed for over five years. And so it's, it's a lot um, and it's um, part of what you may need to manage over time. 
and something that a lot of, of people try to factor into their own financial plan if they're going to, to need to help. Um, and then the conversation number four is about costs. Um, and you may um, work up to that over time. These are the costs in, in the Bay Area. Uh, it's likely cheaper almost everywhere else, but um, since that's where a lot of our clients are, uh, we wanted to show, and it, it's really, even if it's elsewhere, it's always a significant amount. Um, so even to have someone come in this, this first um, in-home care, even to have someone come in um, four hours a week just to help with light housework or some activities of daily living, that can cost over $4,000 a month. So it just, this is why it may not be possible to stay at home if, if care is needed. Because for full-time care, 24 seven, um, it really gets to be prohibitively expensive if that's gonna be needed for a long time. Um, your parents might be able to have the means for to fund this, but it's good to have the conversation about whether they have long-term care insurance and maybe review that with them to see what it covers. Um, and because sometimes things can happen where you don't have a lot of time to think about it. There may be a fall or some change in medical issues and then you kind of have to, are, are forced to confront these things in a very short period. So the more you can be armed with the information going in, the, the better, um, you know, ready you are to help. So, um, so that we don't kind of to end on, on a little bit of a lighter note, um, we wanted to finish with some technology that can help your parents stay at home. So these are really geared to alleviating or bridging that, that feeling between the health and safety that we maybe are most concerned with, with parents' desire to, to maintain their independence. So. Um, the first thing are smart home systems um, that we may already have. Things like Simply Safe or Apple HomeKit are things that allow you know remote door locks and home security systems and cameras, things like that. So that and many of them can be voice enabled, which you know helps um, older people to to use them. Um, and really just gives people peace of mind that, especially if your parents don't live near you, that they're, they're safe. Um, and, and you can check in on things remotely. One of the simplest things is to get them an Apple Watch or a Fitbit. Um, it has great fall detection and it will automatically call uh, an emergency if needed. So I use this with my father because I was very worried about him falling. Um, he actually fell once and so then I was perpetually worried about that. Um, and I live far away. So it's just as effective as the clunky, um, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up things that I think everyone refuses to wear. So it's a lot cooler than that. And it also has some health and sleep metrics that you may want to check in on, including heartbeat and I, I believe the Fitbit also has like an AFib detector if, if your parent has some kind of heart issue. So um, I think that's a really good, good option. Um, Alexa Together is kind of, should be maybe an easier way to communicate and keep in touch easily. Um, it can let you know without checking in directly if your parent is kind of up and starting the day, they can check in and or let you know they took their medicine or. Um, something that, so that you don't have to check in five times a day, um, or even help you set up video calls uh, in, in shared video um, so that instead of FaceTiming, which can be challenging. Um, and the um, medication dispensers, I think I wish I had known about, um, because again, that's always a concern. Are, is your parent taking medicine that they need to take correctly? Um, so that can alleviate that concern. There's, these are still evolving. The, there's some that can't do all medicines, um, but generally it's something you would fail a week at a time, and then it would alert them to take their medicine and give the right dosage at that time. 
Um, some of them also don't have power backup, so that can be an issue. Um, the last thing included here, just that I think you might want to look up, is um, an artificial intelligence companion called LEQ. Um, it is a little futuristic, but it gets really good reviews and could be helpful in some situations. It's basically a companion robot that I'm small um, that reminds them of things and quizzes them on, on things. So. Um, all of this is kind of interesting and, and could be helpful, especially if your your parents want to continue to live in their house and live alone. Um, just to give you some, some resources, um, and we can give these to you physically too, but just to review, um, the Gen Worth site is where the costs of care were meant, that were mentioned in the presentation. And it has costs for every region in the country. So, <coughs> excuse me, if your parent isn't in the Bay Area, it will give you an idea of the costs where they are. Excuse me one second. Um, and then there's this elder co-housing site on squarespace.com <coughs> to get more information on that option and where that's available. Because as I said, I think it's intriguing and um, one that seems to be growing. Um, a lot of the tech options that are included here are from a New York Times article that I, I think is really valuable um, in a column called Wire Cutter from April 1st of this year. <coughs> and it was specifically about tech um, to help people stay at home safely. <coughs> Well, Seth, while you're taking a sip of water there, I'll pass on a question that came came in. Um, so the question is, my parents are fine right now. At what age should I start this conversation? And should I get my siblings in on the conversation too, or just do it one-on-one? -on -one? Um, I think if possible, it is better to have a conversation with your siblings first, even if it's just to let them know that you're going to talk about this because you don't want it to come up in some way that it's not intended. I think anything that um, promotes transparency should be encouraged. So I do think it's a good idea to probably start that with a, a sibling if you have them. And then, because um, they might also have some ideas or they may have had a conversation that they weren't transparent about with you, but they, you know, they may have some information to provide. But that, that's a really good point. And, and finance, family dynamics kind of loom large over all of this. Um, but generally, I would say, you know, transparency is best. Um, the last thing on this list is a book called Being Mortal by Atul Gawande, which I think I have recommended to anyone within earshot of me in the past five years. Um, we did a review of it in our newsletter a little while back um, because I think if you're anywhere in this, um, you know, in along this spectrum of worrying either a little bit or a lot about your parents, it provides a really good perspective about aging, including our own aging, um, and as something that we all go through as mortals. Um, and so I highly recommend that. Um, it is soon to be a major motion picture as well. So you can wait for the movie, but um, I think it, it really helped me um, when I was, was dealing with this with, with my own parent. So I would um, recommend that. Um, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. We really appreciate your time today. Um, really love to get your suggestions about maybe what other topics you might like to see in the future or um, uh, questions that you might have or resources you might want to check in about. I don't see any others come through, but certainly we'll take them by email afterwards if people have any follow-up questions. Excellent. And we do have this available. Um, uh, we will have a recording of this available um, if you want to share it with anyone. Um, but we really appreciate you attending and, and have a great weekend. Great. Thank you.